Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are ready for another podcast. Podcast, but as always, we're going to drop into some breath first. So if you are driving, please breathe with us, but just don't close your eyes. And if you are somewhere where you can start to slow down and sit down, that would be great. So Kelly, for you, for me, listeners, for you guys, if you're in a safe place, close your eyes, go ahead and starting to shift from that busy and chaotic outer world into our inner world. Feeling our feet on the floor, sitting straight up, and through the nose, inhaling as we let the belly expand and bring that breath all the way up, sipping in a bit more at top, holding the breath, and through the mouth, exhale, and the belly expand as we inhale. Bring that breath all the way up, sipping in a bit more at the top, holding the breath here, and exhaling, letting it go, letting it go. One last one, big expansive inhale, letting the belly expand and bringing that breath all the way up, sipping in a bit more air, holding the breath, applying a root lock. And audible sigh, exhale, let it go, let it go, let it go. And just flickering the eyes open when you're ready. And here we are with Kelly Melissa Reinhardt. So stoked to be interviewing you after I was on your podcast and hearing all the great things that you're up to. And I wanted to get you on this podcast and really share your story. So in just a word or two, how would you say you're feeling in this moment right now, just to drop into presence? After that breath work, I'm just feeling really calm and excited. Sweet. And that's all it took, really. 90, 90 seconds, three breaths. That's amazing. Well, cool. So for those of uh, anyone that's listening who doesn't know your story, can you just take a few minutes here to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about the organization, how it came to be, and then we'll just start to unpack it from there. Absolutely. Uh, So I started my organization in 2018. It is called Make Mental Health Matter. Formerly, we were BCC Evolution but I started it after I lost my middle sister in 2017 to who died by suicide. And it was just something that I knew I wanted to make a difference. And even if it was one person at a time, and what I came to find out is that I wasn't really educated about how to help others. And that's what I decided I was going to, after several, uh, courses that I've taken and certifications that education was going to be the thing that we did to give back to the community to really help try to navigate this mental health space that tends to be really inundated. So if we can put everyday people like you and I in that space that can help others, then we can really start having 
really good conversations, get them possibly connected into the community and actually start saving lives. So I'm thank you for sharing. And it's amazing what you're doing. I'm going to ask a question that I've thought a million times, but I don't know if I've really actually asked it. And I think this is a really good place to ask this question, especially since you're someone who lost your sister to suicide about seven years ago and started an organization about suicide prevention, awareness, and mental health getting to the core. So in terms of like community, Communicating, holding space for someone like I never really know the right thing to say in a situation like this. Like, do I say I'm sorry? You know, what's the best thing that someone can do to hold space for someone where it, the we'll just call it death, whether it's a death or specifically what we're talking about here, suicide, or it's not like it's fresh, fresh, and it just, just happened, but it's like seven years ago. But I mean, also we're not putting a timestamp on these things, being like, oh, that was a while ago. So you must not be processing anymore. You know, it's just a little bit different. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I will. I mean, I'm going to share from my experience. I know, I mean, in society, like our number one thing to go to is saying, I'm so sorry for your loss. And although I do have to receive that, I actually hate when people say that because I am like seven years in, I talk about this all the time. And I know that I need to receive that from them because that's how we've kind of been trained as society to say, I'm so sorry for your loss. But it could also just be more of an acknowledgement of like, Ugh, like what I say is like, oh my gosh, that really sucks. I'm sorry to hear about the loss of so-and-so. Because when I hear people say, I'm so sorry for your loss, I'm like, well, you didn't do it, right? Like my brain goes that okay. way. Um, but I am not the norm. Well, maybe I am, but uh, people that I have talked to in the grief and loss community are very much in the same place of, yeah, I don't need you to apologize, right? But we also have to know how to receive from people who maybe don't know how else to have that conversation. So it's okay to say other things like, man, that sucks. Or, oh, wow, I'm sorry to hear about your sister passing or something of that nature. And then also a really great space if they want to talk about their story. Not everybody is so open and transparent as I am. But if they're ready to share that information, they absolutely can in that space. And so for me, what I have learned over time is that I really just listen. When somebody says something to me um, that they have lost somebody, whether it be to suicide or anything else, I just say, oh gosh, that, I mean, depending on what it is, if it's a trauma or not, um, I usually say, oh, that might be really hard for you or something of that nature. Not really like, I'm sorry, I don't say that. But then just holding that space of like, hey, I'm here to listen if you want to talk about it. If you don't, that's okay too. But I think that it's just important that we can be okay in silence. It doesn't have to be a place that we're filling the gap because maybe we just felt really uncomfortable that I told that to you and you're like, I don't know what to say. But it's okay to just pause and just have that silence. And if they're ready and wanting to share, they can absolutely share what's going on. But sometimes people just need others to simply listen, which can be challenging because we often as humans want to fill this space, but we can also find that space to just listen and respond when they're ready for us to, but not in a way of like fixing anybody or um, trying to make it better, just simply listening. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it's interesting that you brought in fixing at the end because my mind was kind of jumping to this section in one of the books I wrote called Soul Life Balance, the human fixer pandemic, because a lot of times like we kind of go to someone else's stuff as a way to avoid looking at our own and bringing this back to the I'm sorry piece. I've been seeing this in my communities over the years and just need to gently remind them, but like say there's a client of mine that's paying like, to have group coaching and then they can't make a call. I'm sorry that I'm not going to be there. I'm like, is that I'm sorry for me or is that sorry for you because you're paying for this thing and then you should feel that. And then what's the deeper layer there, you know, but in terms of holding space for someone with loss, um, 
I asked you that question because from my own experience as a suicide survivor and other traumas that I have shared, when someone says, I'm sorry, that and the suicide situation I had was 16 years ago. Um, so it was quite some time ago for me. Um, not that it matters, but it, it doesn't feel as fresh. Um, but when someone says like, I'm sorry, all of a sudden I, it on a subconscious level and b you being an NLP practitioner, you probably have some things to say about this, but I received that on subconscious or unconscious and being like, oh, wow. Like, is, is this bad? Like, should I be feeling this way? Right? Like you're apologizing, it puts me in there. So it almost does like a disservice really uh, to the subconscious. What do you think about that piece of it? Yeah, no, that's kind of like where I was kind of going to, but I wasn't, I was trying to <laughs> see how I worded it. But yeah. um, yeah, it is whenever I almost glaze over it when people, because it comes up every time, right? Like, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. And I just keep talking because I don't know why it is. It's like that unconscious level. I'm just like, okay, I'm sick of hearing that for me. That's just how I am because yes, it kind of, it almost shifts you back into that space. And I'm like, I'm not there anymore. I'm here. Like I am not fully healed by any means. And it will never be something that I quote unquote get over or that I like forget about. But it's also, I am just in such a different place in my life with grief and loss. And um, it almost transports me back to that moment. And yeah, I just, I don't, um, there was a, I forgot what I was watching, but they're like, yeah, you Americans say sorry for everything. It was somebody um, in Europe. They're like, yeah, the Americans say sorry for everything. And I'm like, we do. And then you start listening to how many people actually say sorry. And you're like, are you sorry? Like you didn't do anything. So why right. are you saying sorry? So yeah, just unconsciously, uh, your brain kind of shifts you back into that space potentially. So the, I guess the gist of what I'm saying is be aware of what you're saying. And I know that within society, we have, that's been kind of the conversation that we've had around grief and loss, as you say, I'm sorry, but it's not really for you to say, sorry, say something else like, oh man, that must be really hard or, oh, that sucks. Or I'm sorry to hear about, because I am like, I don't need to apologize for every, anything, but it sucks to hear that somebody passed in your family. So just be aware of the words that you use and maybe try something new. <laughs> You, you know, I love that you say like that sucks because like my former self would be like, that's not enough though. Like, but I love that you're bringing the humanness into it. And just a week ago today at this time of the recording, I was paddle boarding. It was the first time that I, I paddle board in the ocean. And I mean, it was the third time I paddle board in the ocean probably in a year. And I used to go like, you know, at least once a week or a couple times a week. So it's been a while and I was coming on to shore and I saw my neighbor and i i've heard some like screams and different things over the past few nights but he walked up to me just started crying and gave me a big hug and told me that his son was killed in a car accident and um then i because my parents know him too i called up my parents afterwards to tell them and i noticed like after i told my parents what happened like i mean just speechless right but like what i said was that sucks. And then immediately after that, I had my adversarial voice come in, you know, my limiting voice come in to be like, that's no way to hold space. And I was like, get out of here, go away. Like doing a little bit of parts work. Right. And be like, wow, that actually, even though like from a societal point of view, like you never say like that sucks, that's not enough, but that's what I was feeling. And to like allow myself to express that, felt really good and obviously not to him but like you know and the people are helping me process i was holding space for them as well and just to your point of like be real be a human and this is what gets people to a point of suicide or something else needing to feel like we need to wear a mask so i love that you brought that in yeah i so it kind of goes into we were when we originally started um what was bcc evolution uh we were thinking about taglines and 
uh, my family and I, we were all coming up with all these words and we finally landed on, I mean, there were some interesting and funny ones and the not so funny ones that were like, that's not really great, but we landed on suicide sucks because it does. Mm-hmm. I mean, the process, the process of being a survivor to the loss of suicide, it just sucks all around and there's no other way to really explain it. And so that's why I often use that word, but yeah, like you said, it's just be real, be a human. And sometimes we don't choose the right words. Sometimes we don't say the right things, but the cool part about being human is that we can make mistakes and we can shift and change and pivot and try again. And Mm. that's the coolest part about just all grief and loss in general, because I really believe that it's a journey. It's a journey that you will go on throughout your life, your whole entire life. It doesn't just stop. Like you said, time, it's not time limited. It really is something like I call it a roller coaster. There are some days that I don't even want to get out of bed. And then there's some days that I can talk about my sister till I'm blue in the face. So, you know, it just, it's this, what I call a roller coaster of life and emotions and this journey that I really truly am on. And unfortunately I have lost multiple other people before and after my sister. And it just becomes part of my life and this journey that I am on. Well, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And it, it, I, I won't go to another tough area and topic that's coming up. And it's this idea of victim mentality, um, because for me, I sometimes can let kind of like my uh, not so healthy and safe masculine come through of being like, I don't have time for or patience for victim mentality because I've been there and I see that in myself and that's my own trigger point. And I know like that's a lot of work for me. So it's hard to hold space for someone else when they're going through their process and just totally stuck in that lower density and frequency of victim mentality. And at the same time, there is so much compassion that I have for people that are experienced. We all do to different degrees, but the tough conversation here and topic that I'm, I'm really wanting to get at is For someone like yourself who has lost not only your sister to suicide, but you're surrounded in this talk because it's your mission, it's your organization, you have a team, events, podcast show, all the things, and you're seeing more people you know or you have um, that have lost their lives to suicide, when you feel within yourself any form of victim mentality creep in, how do you work with that energy? Well, I love that question because I, I'm probably the worst for myself. Um, and again, I live and breathe this world. I also, like you said, I'm a, a neuro-linguistic programming master practitioner, like getting my international coaching federation certification. Like I'm doing all the levels, all the things. And I still have those moments that I am, <laughs> I know now the words that pop into my head or as I say to people is the words that we say to ourselves and the words that we say to others are really important and I notice now just because of my training when those start to creep in and I know how to shift them not I'm not perfect by any means but the one thing that I usually say the most is is this about me or is it about them or the situation or the event? And if it's a confrontation, say with somebody else, is it about me or is it about them? And when I say that, if it is about me, then that triggers me to maybe do a little bit more work on myself of like, what is it within myself that's getting triggered because of this situation or this person or whatever it might be? If it's about them, I have now learned that I can just let that go and that's okay. I was not that way prior to really my training. Um, I was a person who didn't forgive often. And if you did anything to me, I held grudges. And um, I maybe was not the nicest person 
um, prior to <laughs> learning more about myself and learning about others. But I really like, as I have gone through this process, I've learned that sometimes the energy is not for me to hold on to. And even my own energy, if my own energy is getting into the space that it's not in a good place, maybe I'm constantly like thinking the pile effect, like, oh, this happened or that happened or this happened or that happened, right? Um, I can start to acknowledge that energy. And then what I have learned is just feeling whatever it is in there. Like if, if it's me being mad, me, me being sad, like whatever that might be, and then I can release it. And that's not anything that like is easy to do by any means, but I can start to just shift my energy because it's not my responsibility to carry around everybody else's baggage, including my own baggage. Right. And I, actually one of my mentors told me that is, um, we were in a class and she, uh, kind of, <laughs> she's like, is that yours to hold on to or, or not? And I was like, oh, okay. So it made me mm -hmm. start thinking like, what are the energies? And I, I think that I am uh, slightly empathic. So I tend to absorb other energies when I'm around, around a lot of negativity. I tend to be negative when I'm around a lot of positivity. I tend to be positive or I try to shift the negativity into positivity because that feels more comfortable for me. And so I have learned over time that it really truly does matter who you surround yourself with. You can't always pick and choose some of the people that are in your life, but you can absolutely pick and choose other people that are in your life. And I have the responsibility to um, control my energy because I can't control anybody else's energy. But I also, like you said at first, is there are some people that get in that cycle of like the darkness or the heaviness or whatever you want to call it. And there are points in time that you can stop trying to help that person because they may be stuck in that cycle and it takes more energy from us trying to help them get out of that space. But I also believe that those little tiny shifts or words or things that we say or do with those people that are in those low places could potentially shift everything for them. It may just not be at that moment, um, but it can get really heavy if you allow yourself to go into their energy. So just be aware if you are trying to support somebody that maybe is in a really hard place, somebody that it really truly is struggling. I have had to remove myself from situations and from certain people because I expended all the energy that I possibly could to help them and they weren't ready to help themselves. And that was a hard lesson that I had to learn because I'm very much a helper and I want to really fully support people. But there are some people that until they're ready to get help, you can't fully help them but those little plants, those little seeds that you're planting at those moments may make a difference. You just might not see it because maybe you might have to remove yourself from that situation or that person's life to be able to support yourself and your energy. Hopefully that answers yeah. what you just said. No, it's, it, yeah, answered in a, a little bit more too. So that gets us into the waters of uh, suicidal indicators. Really, that's what I'm hearing from you. That's kind of where we're at now. And this is a, a touchy place, right? Because there might be people that you know in your life, you, you guys listening, that are sad, that are in a depressive type state. And they might not have ever once considered suicide in their life. But it, so even for you knowing them, you might be like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't have even crossed my mind. Or it could be something where they have considered it, but you wouldn't know it and you just think that they wouldn't. Right. That's another thing. Um, so there's so many different layers, but then also like there's that piece that I was bringing in earlier of the tough love, like the 
what I've really been leaning into for myself and thus my clients and on the podcast and where I teach is more tough love as of late. Um, and the way I frame the tough love is like, Hey, if you're doing the work and by quote unquote doing the work, I mean, any of the shadow work, anything where you're willing to look at anything in your life at all. I'm not necessarily talking about plant medicine. You know, that's like deep, deep, deep doing the work, obviously, but any sort of quote unquote doing the work, you know, the work, it's shadow work. That's all it is. If you're doing it at all, I think about it this way. What's the point of learning about doing the work if we're not going to actually apply it when we need it most? So for me, I'm starting to look at it more from an athletic point of view. Like I'm not a former athlete. I would not consider myself an athlete, but I did compete in some triathlons. But like it's that game time energy, like let's go. Like, okay, this is the big game. I've been training and learning about this stuff because I find it fascinating for whatever reason reason other than I feel alive uh, when I'm talking about because I'm not just wearing a mask and pretending like everything is good. Now that shit is hitting the fan. Yes, this sucks. And it's game time. Let me at least try to find some ounce of enthusiasm because I know from prior experiences of leaning in to do the work that when I do lean in and surrender to this, it is setting me up for the next thing. So with all of that preamble said, like, um, what are some suicidal indicators to consider? Yeah. So I love what you just said also about, I mean, when you, cause I also talk about like doing the work, right? Like you actually have to be in there doing the work. Um, and when we talk about suicide, it really is, I mean, sure, I can give people resources and I can get them connected into therapists or coaches or um, whomever it might be, right, on the holistic spectrum or whatever. But me connecting you and you not making those connections and actually going and doing it, nothing's going to change. And that's the thing is that, um, I was kind of saying earlier is you can help somebody and help somebody and help somebody and they're just going to, uh, well, so what I have seen in the past is I have helped a couple people through crisis, but, um, one of the biggest ones that came up for me was I connected this certain person into like every avenue that I could possibly think about. And then they just rejected all of that help. And I was like, why did I just spend my energy trying to help you when you're not going to take any of the help that I am trying to give you. And they really like shifted right into mistrust. And right. that's oftentimes uh, one of the symptoms or signs um, that you can, well, you wouldn't really see mistrust, but you might hear them talking about, well, I don't trust so-and-so, or I don't want to get help from so-and-so because they don't know what they're doing or um, words that come out like that. But other things to be oh, on real the, quick on that, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So is that kind of like tie in with paranoia? Would you say it could? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it's usually like, um, oftentimes, well, anybody who experiences a traumatic event may not trust or they feel like they don't have a sense of control. And so they're trying to gain all of that control back. But once somebody else is helping them, then sometimes they start, well, they'll either shift into trust or they'll shift into mistrust. Mm -hmm. And that does usually come out in um not being able to actually help somebody the way that you want to or need to be able to help them um and so yeah it could be i mean it could be a control thing it could be um all sorts of i mean all sorts of things that might come up for them but um it's really like um i'm like where was my brain going with that that's okay i'll go back to the other point um <laughs> If you're looking like suicidal thoughts, tendencies, signs, symptoms, um, the one of the biggest one is like isolation. And mm. I know that that's hard right now because of the pandemic. Like some people are still isolating themselves, but 
if you if they're really starting like maybe they have always played i don't know why this is popping in my head but they always play golf um or maybe they've always been a paddleboarder and then all of a sudden they don't like to do that at all or maybe they are always on time at work and then all of a sudden they are constantly late like there's these little tiny shifts um, like my sister, I talk about it as she was very much of an upkept person. Every single holiday we would have as a family, she would always present very well. She um, always had her hair done, her makeup done. And I look in retrospect of the Christmas before she passed and she looked very disheveled. She looked very tired. And that was something that I didn't recognize because I didn't have any of the skills or the tools that I have today. But I didn't notice it until now I look at it with, through the eyes that I have. And now I see like her, what I call the unraveling of my sister. It wasn't something that I noticed during that time. But those are the slight things that you can start to notice. And oftentimes when we talk about mental health, which is generally the underlying cause, like a mental health challenge, illness, disease, whatever you want to call it. I like challenge. Um, it is like medication might be a part of that. And maybe they have gone off their medication or maybe they are, um, bills are past due. Maybe they had a job loss. Maybe they had a relationship loss. Like there's so many things, again, kind of that piling effect of the, well, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. And I know like with my sister, she had been diagnosed with MS and um, she was going towards a uh, breakup. And so there's all these things that were compounding. And then she just managed to act, have access to the means. And that was not something that we had ever considered. So any expressions that people, maybe they're talking more about death, maybe they're starting to give away their personal things. Maybe they're starting to isolate. You're not talking to them as often. Um, their behaviors start to shift in or out of like our, I say we have all have baselines. So we're really looking for those extreme highs or lows because it can be either or. And oftentimes the one that we miss the most is mood changes, especially with youth, because sometimes they have these periods of depression then all of a sudden they're really, really happy. And most of the time that is because now they've created a plan and they feel okay about what's about to happen. And so it only almost shifts into a happiness type of state. Those are the mood swings that we often miss the most. And then also research has shown that three months after a period of improvement is actually when we lose the most people because they start kind of coming out of that fog and now they can actually take action towards the plan that they created three months prior. So those are two things that mood and then this period of improvement that we often miss the most. So the last piece, uh, you lost me. So the the where we lose the people the most, and, and you mean lose them to suicide? Yeah, to so, suicide. So what's happening there is they're riding a high, and then they're no longer on a high, and then they come crashing down. Is that what's happening? Yeah, so when you, so say you go to the doctor, right? So now you're starting to see a therapist and um, everything seems to be getting better, right? And so it's usually three months after that period of improvement is when they're noticing that we lose the most people to suicide because they get to this point that maybe they've been going to the therapist or the psychologist, they feel like they're doing really good. Maybe their medication is balanced or something. And then something happens. And then that's when now they're in the state of mind that they can actually take action on what their plan was that they created, like they're like a plan to die by suicide. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's like they're doing all the right things and everything seems to be getting better. 
but then all of a sudden maybe something happens like a life event or um, maybe they stop going to the therapist or maybe they stop taking their medication because they're feeling better. And that's when we're losing the most people to suicide. So what, what it feels like to me, and I'm going to be as careful as I can with my word choices here, but um, it sounds like these people are gaining confidence that now they're on the right track. They're stepping into the unfamiliar. It's becoming familiar. Then that trigger point happens that sends them almost, we can call it on a spiral. And then from there, I don't want to say it's because they've gained the confidence. It's more because they're in a state of action and doing so now with that plan they had previously, it's not that they're gaining the confidence to take their own life, but they're in a state of doing so on a subconscious level. They're like, I can do this thing. You think that's kind of it? Yeah, I don't like I really want to kind of dive more into that myself as far as the research goes. Um, like why that's there's that like trigger that happens around that time. Um, my assumption or my thought process around this is that most people, so if you talk about um, EAP at work, right? Like you can get six weeks or maybe 10 sessions for free. Then after those 10 sessions are gone, then what do you do? Um, the other part is that it takes a little while for medication to adjust and process through your body if it is something that you need medication. Um, and so sometimes you don't get to the potential right dosage or maybe your hormones are now starting to fluctuate, which causes um, other thoughts to pop in or something to happen, right? Like that's my theory. I don't know the exact science, but I do know that that is what um, a lot of mental health professionals have said is that it's three months after the period of improvement. And, and also I'm thinking that we don't have that follow-up system in our, in our mental health system mm. is that we're not consistently following up because we'll watch somebody for 72 hours or for two weeks or for one month, but then we just push them out and are like, Hey, good luck. See you later. And they have to keep themselves on that schedule in order to stay healthy. Right. I mean, our mental health is our brain and it's just as important as our physical health, but we don't treat it that way. We're like, Oh, well, I'm good. I don't have to do this anymore. I don't need to go talk to somebody. I don't need to uh, worry about my medication or whatever that might be, but really we do need to keep up those patterns. And I think the follow-up is the biggest thing that we're lacking when we're talking about the mental health aspect. And so that's my, my theory and my belief. I do want to do more research behind like what that really means, but I know that I have I have heard that so many times when I'm on um, any webinars or um, anything that is really, um, I did a webinar that was called Safer Suicide um, with the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. And that was one of the big things that a lot of the speakers talked about is that three months of period of improvement. So we have to really be diligent as mental health professionals or workers or coaches to make sure that we have that follow-up in that window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It, it feels a little bit like uh, almost like a manic episode in a way. Could yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, to transition a little bit, um, you mentioned we don't have the systems in place and, uh, and for the follow up. In a perfect world, like you're you're building this mission, your organization is called Make Mental Health Matter, right? What would the system look like in a perfect world? Well, I believe, <laughs> I'm like in my perfect world, um, I think that it sh everyone should have access to mental health services, period. We all have access to physical health services why isn't mental health a part of that conversation again we all have a brain our brain is our mental health we don't all have mental health illnesses diseases or challenges however one in 25 americans 
will experience a mental health challenge or um, something like depression or anxiety within a year. So, but it's much more prevalent than you would think it is. So I think that everybody should have access to mental health services on some level. The other part is that we need to just get better in that space of being able to share resources and information. And that's like one of the things that my nonprofit is really trying to do right now is um, in Colorado, we tend to work very fractionalized. We don't, it's like, it like feels like a competition for whatever. And nobody, they're like, well, I do that. I don't want you to do that because I do that, right? It's like, mm -hmm. no, why are we all trying to work separately when we can all just work together? And so we're trying to bring together what we're calling a trusted resource hub because there are tons of resources out there. There's more than I could ever even imagine, but nobody knows about them, including ourselves. And so how can we all come together to be able to help everyone in need? Because there are more people in need than we have in the mental health space right now. The other part is that we need to pay our mental health workers more money like they're dealing with the people that need help so we need to be able to help them so i mean access first and foremost um and then we also like the waiting list the game that insurance plays um is not helpful it is really hard to get insurance to pay for mental health services which just blows my mind and so if we can get the access. So more, more resources. And I think it's really sharing of resources. I don't think we need to put more people in maybe eventually, but I think it's knowing the resources, being mm. able to combine as a collective to help people because we're all doing the same thing. So we might as well do it together. And just because you do what the other person does, doesn't mean that they're going to take away any business. And then also just being able to like have that financial backing, having the insurance um, be on the same page, not make it so hard for people to go get the help that they need. We require a physical every single year. Why don't we require a mental health screening or a mental health um yeah, screening. That's really what it would be, right? Um, why don't we incorporate that every single time somebody goes to the doctor? Because the more that we talk about it, the more resources that we have, the more people are just making it a part of their everyday, um, their everyday pattern, then I think that that is going to help us get to a place that we have more mentally well people than where we're at right now today as a society. Yeah, it's interesting looking at like physical health and comparing it to mental health because when we're using the word access, right? Like for me, I I'm like, well, it feels like there's as much access for mental health as there is physical health because everywhere, anywhere you look, like there's a gym or different type of uh, workout or sport or this or that. And it's like, I don't know where to start, you know, and there's totally so much access to mental health out there, but it's also like, I don't know where to start. And, and then when you brought it in with um, like the doctor regular visit with uh, physical health, I'm like, oh, okay, I see that's where the differences are between physical and mental health, like quote unquote access. Um, what's fascinating about physical health is it's the majority of people that are into taking care of their bodies, like physically working out and nutrition, diet, all of the things, it's generally so that we can feel better mentally, right? <laughs> but we don't think of it that way. And what I've noticed too is some of the, the people that have gone through the biggest hardships in their life became obsessed with their physical health right and it's because of the mental health components that come to it and i think that's why we're starting to see so many fitness trainers kind of veer away from just 
totally fitness and get the emotional and mental point involved as well. I mean, I know for me, like when I think of access to mental health, I think of like our education system, you know, sure. We had PE for me. I'm trying to think back to PE. I'm like, I don't know how much they taught us or just let us run around, you know, but to your point, like that was a priority because you had a physical education class. Us. We're not having a mental educational or let alone emotional educational class. And the majority of the things we learn, I mean, you know, I, I, I know teachers in my life and I, I respect in what they're doing and that's great for them. But as a whole, when I look at our education system, it's kind of like, what are we teaching all of this for a lot? We're not even teaching financial literacy, which has gotten so many of us in terrible hardship. So think finances, think more on PE, more on emotional um, uh, health, mental health, and all of this really combines and kind of correlates to how we communicate with other people. So I think it's great. We need all that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, <laughs> I say that all the time. I'm like, why aren't we teaching like financial literacy? Why aren't we teaching uh, mental when mental and emotional regulation in school? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the things that we're going to take into society. And yes, I absolutely agree with you on that front. And I think that like you just said, because we know that our mind and body are connected, therefore they affect each other. And so when we strengthen our body, it strengthens our mind. And that's why I tend to go much more towards the holistic resources than I do maybe the traditional resources, because I think that people like you and those like physical trainers that are working more on the mental versus just the physical, those are the ones that are really going to start making a difference in people's lives. Because when you work on that physical, it also works on your mental. And a lot of people don't think about the holistic aspects and how beneficial they can be as far as um, other parts that we work on our body affects our mental too. Yeah, for sure. So to close the loop uh, earlier with the suicidal indicators and symptoms, um, if we are seeing that in someone else, how do we hold space for that person? Yeah, I one thing that I teach the most on is listening non-judgmentally, which is a true skill that you have to learn. Like it may sound really easy, but it's ultimately taking your self out of the equation and really truly just listening to somebody when they're ready to open up to you. Because oftentimes, like we were talking about earlier, is we have this fixed mentality. Um, people say all the time, I'm broken, but we're not broken. You may have a small fracture, but really truly nobody ever is broken and we don't have to fix them. So if we can just start to allow space for people to communicate how badly they're feeling or whatever is going on in their life without feeling judged or feeling like that person is going to try to fix them or give them advice or whatever you want to call it, um, then we can start to actually open up those conversations of like, hey, I hear you. I, maybe I'm at a place that I don't know how to help you, but I know people are out there that can help you. And so let me get you connected to whomever it might be. And I think that that's a skill that we really need to learn and understand is that people simply want to feel heard, understood, and they want to be able to express whatever is happening or whatever thoughts are in their head, right? If they have suicidal thoughts or intentions, they want to be able to communicate that without somebody judging them because there's that fear and the stigma and all those other things in today's society that are not helping us have these open conversations. And I mean, for you, I mean, you may have a different perspective on it as being a uh, attempt survivor, 
but oftentimes what I hear from people is that you were the only person that first and foremost asked me the question about suicide, which is, are you going to kill yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Being very direct, questioning, asking, because our brains love clarity. So the clearer we can be with the questions that we ask can trigger and help people understand if they're in crisis or not. But then also just simply listening after that, hey, lay it all out. Let me know. And that's the space that I've been the most successful in is just being quiet and like shutting up, asking the question, allowing them to just process whatever's going on. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes that's actually what help people helps people move towards healing. It, it, the last part you said, that's what helps them helps them move towards healing yeah got it yeah um what's coming up th for me here um for talking oh i remember now if we're talking about holding space for other people what did you call it you had a term for it i liked what you said um, like listening non-judgmentally. Yeah, listening non-judgmentally. I would love to see. I was gonna say need, but I would love to uh, get better at not just always saying hold space because I forget how many people don't have that in their vocabulary. And listening non-judgmentally makes so much more uh, sense than holding space for someone that doesn't know what holding space means, right? And it's saying the same thing, essentially. And what we get taught when we're holding space for someone else is to have like a neutral consciousness, I mean, take ourselves out of it. So listening non non-judgmentally i love that and what was coming up for me is this is a really sticky area in a lot of different kinds of ways and i recently saw two friends i know on facebook i'm rarely on facebook but and you know i was actually in the feed and scrolling and i saw a little bit of an argument from one person that was a quote unquote healer and another person who's on the path. And I think she's maybe starting to do some facilitation. I don't know. Um, but literally like, you know, the person a made a vulnerable post with a vulnerable share person B is going into the comments and talking about how like, well, where is that in you? And like, this is a projection. Then they're bickering and going like, what is this? Right. And that it's funny to see, like, not only in the space that I'm in where it's like you go through a spiritual awakening, you're working with plant and earth medicines, then you're integrating and then you're kind of shifting to um, facilitate and hold space for other people. And how many people get that wrong? And I'm not coming from a judgmental place. I mean, it sounds like I am and maybe I am, but we I see it all the time where it's actually doing more damage because they're infusing their own stuff and their own fix it energy. So if we can see people that are doing trainings, learning about the things, but not necessarily embodying it and integrating it, and now they're teaching other people and which is kind of the wrong way. And then there's also on top of it, someone that's listening to this podcast or hears you or myself speak and they hear us talk about like listening non-judgmentally or um, holding space or whatever, then they're in a situation with this person and they're doing a good job at first. They're, they're holding space, they're listening non-judgmentally, but then they lose their anchor point because they're new to it. And then all of a sudden their own shit comes through and they start projecting and then it's no longer a safe place for the other person so you know it's like wow this is such a mess right you know yeah i <laughs> i'm like you say that so in the coaching world uh as we talk about that it's like i made a choice to continue to up level my education and go for the certifications but oftentimes you hear from people well you don't need a certification it's fine you're helping people blah 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 right and for me like that just shows that i'm fully dedicated to really fully knowing all of the things and i take 
every single learning that I do. And I continue to educate myself because I don't know everything. I will never know everything, but I can take all the pieces that I have learned and put it into really truly um, creating this safe space, what I call the safe space of being able to hold the space or listening non-judgmentally to somebody. But I truly believe in the education portion of if you don't know what you're doing, please go take a class, learn, like don't try to off based off of your own experience, go and create these programs or whatever it might be, right? Because like you just said, is we could potentially harm, not help. And that's my biggest thing with my nonprofit is that anybody on my trusted resource hub, they are going to be something, someone or something that is helpful and not harmful because the last thing I would ever want to do is refer out to somebody that is going to hurt more than they will help. And so I think that's a huge, like, that's probably a conversation we could totally talk about um, as far as how to do the listening non-judgmentally or holding space or creating those safe spaces. But I think it's really, truly like, it's a skill. You've got to learn the skill. And if you're not sure how to do it, search out a certified class that understands how to do that. And I'm not saying that you always have to be certified by any means, but I think the more repetition, the more education, the more uh, confidence or competency that we can get in these spaces really can help people. But what that's, I mean, that's just one of my big, big things is I never, ever, ever, ever want somebody on like our trusted resource trusted resource hub that is going to be harmful and not helpful. And it, yeah. it, it happens a lot, unfortunately. For for sure. And I'd love to do a 2.0 and unpack um, uh, uh, listening non-judgmentally in even more depth and kind of riff and go back and forth. The The piece about the education is, yeah, I see that in you that you're embodying what you're learning and you're integrating it for sure. But there's a whole subset of people that are doing all the different educational courses, certifications, and all the things and they're learning it, but it's not absorbing into them because they're not living living it they're not integrating it they're not embodying it and that yeah that is um it's a struggle and all we can really do there is red flags to look for if we're thinking about working for that working with that person right uh but yeah bringing this back to holding space and noticing the symptoms and mental health really getting to the root of it. If we can increase our own mental well-being through getting curious of the different avenues to do the work, obviously one of the big things I teach is subconscious mind and regulating the nervous system with breath work. You, know, you teach really deep stuff with NLP specifically and a lot more modalities as well. And the more that we can prioritize our own emo emotional and mental health, then it's going to really help raise the collective consciousness at the end of the deal. So Kelly, this has been awesome. It's been a little bit of everything. So it's uh, awesome to know more about your organization. I appreciate you coming on the podcast for people to hear your story. I appreciate how you're showing up, sharing your story, and just creating this amazing resource. Guys, the website is, is makementalhealthmatter.org. So definitely check it out. Um, Kelly's got a bunch of statistics there and a lot of different resources that you can check out. Kelly, on your end, any final words that you'd like to share? Just thank you so much for having me. And I love this conversation that we have. Uh, one thing that I always say is if we open our mind, hearts, and mouths together, we can make mental health matter. Oh, I love that. Open our minds, our mouths, and our hearts, you said? Yeah, our minds, our hearts, and our mouths. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, sweet. The top three, uh, not top three. Anyways, yeah, my mind was going to chakras, but there's a crown above that. Anyways, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This has been fun, and we'll see you again soon.